Thanks, Hank. I'm blushing a little bit right now. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey Doctor O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Stefan Bolt. for the money he stayed for the girl gateway to the galaxy the new series everyone is talking about beginning with book one into the breach frank and marine space corps one find themselves across the galaxy in a wwe smackdown with the legions of a boss level villain but the party's just getting started he donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl well an empress now destiny's calling in a death a lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Essence, Book 1, Septima. The first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens, infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth. But first, he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book One, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have one of my very best writer friends uh, on the show with me. Uh, Stefan Boltz was one of the first people that I met in this writer community and uh, has uh, has just been a dear, close friend. Not only uh, are we friends, but he is a writer whom I greatly respect and and the work that he puts out is uh, is head and shoulders above everything else. And I think you, uh, those of you that know Stefan, and he's been on the show several times, uh, know that to be true. And we always have a great time talking because uh, he, he's one of those writers that connects on a heart level, and that's something that I uh, genuinely appreciate. Uh, welcome back to the show, Stefan. Thanks, Hank. I'm blushing a little bit right now. Oh, stop it. Stop <laughs> it. You're German. You don't blush. Like, wow. <laughs> no, I, I blush very, like, you know, I'm blushing. You, know. <laughs> you, you blush very stoically. <laughs> I very, like, strongly, you know. <laughs> very strongly. With an accent, right. with a thick accent. 
you're you're actually wearing a power lifting unitard right now, aren't you? As you say, <laughs> <laughs> I have to look that word up. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll I'll send power you a picture. Power lifting unitard. Yeah, okay, I'll send you. A picture. <laughs> don't don't no please don't. Yeah, don't look at your phone while we're recording because <laughs> I may right. just send you random things that are not good. But <laughs> but. <laughs> Stefan, it's been about a year since uh, since we've done a show, and that and, is uh, yeah. criminal and uh, borderline tragic <laughs> that we've gone this long uh, without recording a show. And uh, I, I warned you before we started, that I was a little punchy today, but I think that means we're going to have a, a fun time. Uh, yes, good, good. But you have some awesome news and that, uh, that we are talking about today, and that's because today, uh, when folks are hearing the show, the third and final book in the white dragon series alchemy is out uh refresh a woohoo that that is uh celebration worthy um so refresh everybody about the white dragon uh we started with book one genesis uh, book two crucible and uh this third book has been a little elusive and uh i (laughs) (laughs) and i i love that um you know, uh, I think readers can get frustrated sometimes that that the book they're waiting on hasn't uh, hasn't come out yet. Uh, you know, right. and we can I you apologize. Can, well, well, but you know, you can look online and you can follow you know certain areas of fandom, and you know, we've got like George R. R. Martin. God love him. Uh, I would right. not want to be in his position. Um, no, nope. you know, but he's like put out something like two books in 15 years or, or something like that. And, and people, you know, are, are very serious about their fandom. Uh, and you know, the third book of your series, it was nothing like that. Um, but what I really appreciate is that you did not just rush to put book three out. You made sure that the story was what it was supposed to be before getting it out. Uh, and and you can talk a little bit about that if you want to, but refresh people on this series. Uh, how did it get started? Who is this character, and why is the story so important to you? Um, it started with a certain uh, person, Hank Garner is his name. <laughs> um, he said, hey, are you writing for Apocalypse Weird? And so that was that was actually the 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 origin of the story if you think about it i forgot um, because about that. Remember that it was yeah it was it was in 2000 and i'm not sure 13 or 14 when um apocalypse weird started and i kind of followed it on the periphery and then you said hey why aren't you writing for them and then there was this five people you had a, a show the, the round table the author like round table round table right yes and on the show, I think Michael Bunker asked, hey, so you want to write for Apocalypse Weird? And I said, sure. And I was thinking, yeah, right. They let me write for them. <laughs> and then I forgot for, for like a week. I did. I had I completely blotted it out until you reminded me and you said, hey, uh, what's going on? Are you writing for them or what? <laughs> so I I wrote to Nick Cole and he wrote me back this long, very long. Remember the the whole thing with the black dragon and and the blindness and everything. And I, <clears throat> at that moment, basically what I had in my head was this, this amulet with the black background and a white dragon on it. And I thought, oh, okay, white dragon is the title. And I was very, very excited from the first moment he, he said, okay, let's do it. And I, I pitched him the idea and that, I think that was that was that was that, but uh, the first scene I had in my head, which was the, that amulet, and then I had the last scene in my head, which I can't tell you because it's the end of book three. Um, but so <laughs> I had those two bookends, and now obviously the question is: so how do you get from that very tiny little amulet in the beginning to the end, the the, the major? Uh, final scene of the whole series. How do you get there, right? I mean, that's obviously <clears throat> the question of everybody. Every writer has, but um, you know, in between that is like four years of uh, devastation and candy, <laughs> and you know, yeah. But, anyway. What um, you 
you are a very visual writer, and um, I, I love how you you get ideas and they, they come to you as as visual images a lot of times, and then there may be an emotional component that that ties to that. I, I remember our very first conversation with, when we recorded a show, and you you told the story of the three feathers and uh, and how you know a, a, a visit to um, uh, you know, to, uh, to an office and you were going through some, uh, through this, this exercise, a sandbox Therapy. kind of thing. Yes, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and how visually that story just kind of, uh, kind of grew out of that, uh, right. that, that visual right. thing. Um, it, does that happen to you always? And when you get something like, like if Nick tells you, you know, there's this black dragon and then you get an image of like, uh, a visually opposite thing. You know, well, this has a black mm-hmm. ground and a white dragon. Um, what is, what is the process like for you to interpret those, those ideas that come that way? And even when they seem to be, you know, if Nick says black, then I see white. Well, how's that going to fit into the whole scope of this? But, <laughs> but you, it's like you immediately knew it's like, how do you, uh, interpret that? And, uh, and you know, are, are those right. are, are those things you can trust when, you know, when things pop in your head? Uh, right. I mean, I think one of the one of the 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 things that make me trust them is the emotion that would be attached to it. If there would not be no emotion attached to it, it would just be an image, and I think it would probably drop after a while. But if it has an emotion attached to it, I think that's what kind of makes it stick and that's what makes it worthy um to pursue a little bit further with the the white dragon it was because nick mentioned the black dragon and in my head it was a very natural thing okay so if evil is the black dragon um the light the darkness and the light so the light would be the counterpart to the darkness um so there would be uh maybe a white dragon would be the counterbalance to that and um so the it was immediately there was immediately an emotion to it because I thought about what if what if, the, if there would be this apocalyptic event that would be experienced through a, a teenage girl like an eighteen year old girl that just finished high school first day of freedom from from high school a party on the beach you know in in the summer um, h- how would this girl um, experience that apocalyptic event and then also um there is something inside her that she discovers throughout those next 36 hours in the book one that um is beyond anything she can possibly comprehend for herself and so so that was a very emotional very emotional um spark you know, with with her, with how would you react if all of a sudden the apocalypse would happen now, right now at this moment? You know, and then you would find out there's something in you that could save everybody, but it could kill you in the process. So it's, you know, the the, the emotion is always the most important thing for me. I think for for a lot of writers, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, this story is a is a great metaphor for. Um for, for life in general, but you know, how we deal with adversity, what, what the thing inside of us is that, uh, that allows us to not just live life, but to really experience life. Um, there, there are a lot of people that just go through life. And then there are people that realize that they have gifts and they have something to give to the world. Uh, but usually those things come with a lot of pain and discomfort and getting outside of your comfort zone. You know, we talk about that a lot and that I think that kind of gets overused sometimes, but it really is true that for, for anything great to happen, there, there usually is a lot of discomfort that comes with that. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in this story with, in Casey Byrne, your, your main protagonist, um, she's just a regular everyday girl that, that, that then, um, these these supernatural and you know otherworldly things happen to her and and she becomes someone else uh but that is not without heartbreak and and trouble and right. a- adversity and and all of that and it's a it's a really beautiful metaphor for for that and were you thinking that from the beginning like did you did you know that this was going to be this big powerful story 
you know, about, uh, about those things? Um, I think I had a little bit of an idea, obviously, you know, over time during, during the writing, um, this, it kind of increased and, and it became clearer and clearer the, the further I went, but I think by the, by the second book, I had it fully, it was fully there. And it's, it's kind of, and it's interesting with what you say about the pain, because another way of looking at this could also be that what if there is something inside of us that is this burning, you know, this, um, I, I look at people that have fully realized their potential, right? Anybody that has fully realized their potential, I mean, they're not perfect, obviously, you know, not, none of us are, but if somebody has fully realized their potential and you come in into their presence or not even into their presence, but into you, you somehow you see them or you connect with them, there's this burning. It's, it's almost like this, this, ah, this strength, this strong desire that is inside that, that spills out. They can't even help it. And it, it fuels their passion. It sets everything they do onto this one train track towards their goal, right? It, it burns them up in the process, literally. I mean, some, some people, you know, they are totally in that. They die at, I don't know, you know, even 30. You know what I mean? Or, or they live longer, whatever. But it's, it's, that, it's that burning and you can see it and you can sense it in people. They're like, wow, they they have followed their passion 100% throughout their whole life as much as possible. Um, and that was kind of what grabbed me with, with Casey because she realized early on that there's something inside of her that if she doesn't let it out, everybody that is around her, her world will die. You know, that's like the end result is that it will be overrun by the evil that is coming in but in order for her to let it out part of her would have to die also and that is basically the struggle in her with her throughout the books and it increases in book three that's like the main theme in book three but i think it's also our theme because my sense of the pain is what we, what you uh, talked about before is what if the pain is actually because we're we're not letting it out it's almost like the resistance that we're having in letting it out that's the pain you know what i mean it wow. wants to come out we want to find our 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 true the true passion the true meaning of our life and we are kind of we're afraid to let it out i can i feel that when i write i'm i get scared sometimes i'm like it like terrified and and you know what i mean it's yeah. like what if we what what if the holding it in is what causes the pain physical emotional and breaking through that releases it but it it has to increase first you know it's like the the shell has to break out apart right and so that could also be that's my theory for pain well, well i um in, I, I think a lot of us can wrap our head around uh you know that in life, there will be trouble. I mean, I, I think even even, right. even Jesus said that to his disciples. Me, of you know, course, like, of like course. in life there will be trouble. Um, that, right. That's that's just the way it is. Um, and but if you worry, you'll make it double. Well, exactly. Exactly. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, says the great prophet Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but um, uh, and and I think a lot of us can even wrap our head around the fact that that pain is sometimes transformational that uh, mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. I, i'm sure for a uh for a, a caterpillar going through his metamorphosis right. into a butterfly i'm sure that is not a comfortable experience right. so I, I think right. we can wrap our head around that pain is sometimes transformational um right. what what i love that you just said is that sometimes the pain is caused by by us not fully embracing the Right. The, the gifts that we have are the person that we are, and we're actually causing that to ourselves. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. It doesn't make it any better. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. But I think it does help us but, to get uh -huh. a little insight into, right. uh, you know, sometimes the adversity is, is because we're, we're just hard-headed and we're just not doing what we right. know we should be doing. Right. 
Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, that's that, that's yeah. awesome. So, um, so the first book came out, uh, and uh, you know, sadly, Apocalypse Weird didn't uh, meet its uh, yeah. its original goal. But you know, a, a lot of us broke off and, and did our own thing, and I think that the right. spirit of that is still alive, and and we yeah. we still celebrate that, and it's awesome. And I think a lot of great friendships were forged during yes, that. Yes, exactly. Um, so. Exactly. So we, we don't count that as anything but a success because of that. Yeah. Um, so so then you got the first book out. It's really, really well received. People love the character. Um, the second book, I, I think, uh, about a year later came out uh, or right. so. And then, um, you know, you have been very public, uh, you know, on your Facebook page and stuff and talking about the, the struggles of writing and the... Uh, right. you know, what it's like to, to do the deep work to, to really connect with the character and to find out who they are and where they're going and to, to portray that honestly. And be, because you right. don't want to put a book out that's less than honest and that is not the, the full potential of what the story can be. Um, so talk about that experience between book two and book three and, and when the breakthrough came that you knew okay, this is Casey's journey, and this is how it needs to be told. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think what it is, it, I think it was personally for me uh, the case that I think part of me was a little bit afraid of the ending, um, because that was the first image I saw, and it, for me that image was so powerful. It was kind of what pulled it all towards it. You know what? It was was like this magnet, this magnetic force. But on the other hand, so book one was fine, book two was fine because I was still far away from the third and far away from the ending. And then book three came along, and I realized that I was I was stopping myself. I was kind of like, oh, what else can I do? You know, except writing. You know what I mean? So, oh, there's laundry to fold. Hey, you know, stuff like that. But I realized also that this is a, there's a little bit something else going on, not just the story, but for me, um, because of that thing inside that demands our attention, you know, in one way or another, it says, let me out, you know, set me free. Don't hold me prisoner. And that was so... that. I just felt like if I would go through with it, something would happen to me in a way. It, I know that sounds weird, but I, that was my, f I had this fear that um, I, I don't even know exactly how to um, describe it, but it was that fear of, okay, letting it out. You know, what if, you know, for example, what if I write book three and because now it's the trilogy, all of a sudden a lot of people read it, I become successful. Oh my God. You know what I mean? That's like, now I would be on that path and boy, that's, that's a scary thought. You know, I think um, success is a very scary thought for a lot of people without knowing it. Um, so I, I, I think that played a role. And the other thing is truly, um, there's a big difference, as you know, from having a vision in your head and being able to put that into words and sentences and paragraphs and pages that make sense and that have the same meaning to the reader um, or a different meaning. But it, it, it means something to the reader and it's it fulfills that that image or that vision that you had for this long time. That's scary, too, because. You know, what if it doesn't, <laughs> there's a very good chance that the vision I have in my head is not going to translate. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's how to get there because it's all the threads of the story have to intertwine at the right time to make it all this complete picture. Uh, yeah, right. Forget it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, that was the struggle to, I felt a lot of times like, you know what, maybe I should just stop now. Because not a lot of people have read it, it's not going to be a big loss, you know. It's not like I'm, I have a movie contract on it that says, "Hey, you have to have the third book done." You know what I mean? It's like, all right, if hundred people have read it or whatever, it it doesn't matter. But it, I felt like, 
wouldn't be a big loss. But then I realized at some point, no, it would be. It's really important for me to uh, to finish it. And also, there are a, there's actually a good number of readers that are waiting for it. Right. And <laughs> I really own, owe it to them and to myself to to finish it. And it was a very very good thing to do it. Well, and that fear is is very real. That uh, that you know, I see this in my head. I feel it in my heart. But can I uh, make someone else have that same feeling with the way I, I describe and interpret this thing? And and that is very scary. Um, right. Yeah. And and that the the issue of finality and saying, okay, I I did this work. Here it is. Uh, it's done. And I have to. Uh, set it down and I have to walk away from it now because it's finished. And as long as it's not finished, that there are all these possibilities still in your head. Well, I could do this. I could do that. <laughs> exactly. You know, but once, once you write the end and you close the, the back cover, um, that's it. And, and now, right. you know, the world judges you for your work. And that is, it's, it's a terrifying thing that writers set out to do. Um, that, that, you know, very few other people put themselves through that kind of, you know, scrutiny. And, uh, but the story has to be told. That's the, that's the crazy part. Right. Right. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. When you're given the gift, uh, you're, you're not asked if, if you're comfortable with this, you're just given the <laughs> gift and, and then you, exactly. you, know, you have to do something with it or, you know, die a, a lonely, bitter old man and nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's also, it is fulfilling. I mean, the, that's the other thing with writing the writing itself is so fulfilling that right. you know all the plot the plot points you come up with and the the you resolve a problem that you had with the story and it's like oh my god god spoke to you personally right. you know it's like this feeling of oh my god it's like you're you're a, a nerdy reader of fantasy and you just discovered the next plot point in the book that you read but you're actually writing it Exactly, and that's a beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It is. You know, it's that, that's a lot of that's a lot of um, um, reward in that already. Right. Well, you and I had a conversation one day, and I'm uh, we were not recording. I don't think. I think it was an, an offline conversation. We were talking on the phone or something. And um, if I don't exactly remember the context, uh, how we got on it, but mm -hmm. it, it was we were talking probably, if I remember right, about maybe some book series, maybe something a friend of ours had done and was, uh, was seeing a lot of success and we were, you know, uh, uh, celebrating over that and then uh, right. know, just talking about how we felt about that and, and things. And um, you made the comment, you said, well, well writing is my life's work. And, um, you know, and, and you're, you're happy to... Uh, uh, you, you know, you work in real estate, uh, I, I know, and you, and you do some other things and, and you also, um, uh, are, are really big into your local karate studio and there are other things about it uh, that you do for, for fulfillment and to pay bills and all that stuff. But you said that your uh, that writing was your life's work and that really hung in there with me, um, that, there are, and there are a lot of different, people have a lot of different motivations for writing. Some people have figured out a formula and know that they can write a book every 28 days and publish it. And, uh, and the, the writing may be from their heart or it may not. Um, but they figured out how to be successful at it and to make a lot of right. money in a short amount of time. And, and I am, uh, this, this is no judgment whatsoever on that. If, if that makes you happy, I am all, behind you um but if you feel that this is something that you are you know air quotes called to do uh for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word you know and um uh you, th that you have that gift um right is it something that that you well i think we all go through you know how do we balance you know because writing a book takes a lot of time and is are there things that you could do that um are uh, that time is better spent on well, maybe maybe not I, I don't know um but how do you balance this is my life's work with and, <laughs> and and maybe deal with the frustration when we see other people that are doing stuff and they're just so successful um but you you wonder if this is fulfilling a piece of them 
um, the way you would hope to. Right. Uh, how, how do right. you deal with that? Just the, 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 uh, you know, we're people. These, these are emotions we go through. These are, you know, there's, uh, there's pride and there's, uh, you know, just all the things that, that get us worked up. Uh, as a writer, how do you deal with those things? Boy, that's a really, that's a really good question. Yeah. I told you we were going to go um, deep today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I, I think, first of all, it's so, per, the success is so personal. And, you know, I, I really, I do not remember ever having said that, Hank. I know I probably have said it. Oh, it, it is burned into but, my mind. I, it was like but, a... But I'm glad, I'm glad it is yeah. because I, I have, I forgot about it and I know it's true, but um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of times when I don't let myself realize that, you know, that I feel like I'm not, I mean, there are so many, you know, I'm not good enough a writer or I'm not whatever, whatever it is that we, we do to ourselves, you know, but I, I, I think it's true. It is, it is my life's work in a way that, I really, um, I'm constantly doing it with, in one way or another, like you, you know, you're, you do, if you don't write one thing, you write another thing and then you, you talk to writers all day. So, um, what was your question again? Because I, I when, whenever you all, all, everything you said after that, I was still like, did I really say that? <laughs> wow. <That's amazing. laughs> I, I guess, I, I, right, right. I guess the, the question is just, how do you deal with the, the human emotion of uh, of right. knowing that this is what you're supposed to be doing, and right. and some months uh, it, it you know you get a lot of praise and and you get a lot of book sales, and then another month is you know maybe the the your you, the struggle you're not getting feedback from people, right. and but knowing that this is something you're supposed to be doing and staying right. the course, right? I think that's really what it is. You know, it's. I guess there must be this driving force inside that we're not in touch with all the time. It just kind of happens and we write and we do our thing and we don't realize that we've been doing it for years and years and years. And, and we really want to do this for probably for the rest of our lives in one way or another. Um, you know, but it is, I'm not conscious of it a lot of, a lot of times I'm now even having trouble grasping your question. <laughs> That's it's, it's so weird. You know what I mean? It's like we, I think we deliberately sometimes, or I, I catch myself deliberately um, moving my mind away from that notion that I want to be, I want to be a, a writer or writing is my life's work. That sounds so big, you know, um, and I'm deliberately, I think, making myself smaller in saying, no, I can't do that. I can't be my life's work. You know, I can't have a life's work. You know what I mean? So that's the it's that, a scary a thing. Little bit of, yeah. yeah, and it, yeah. And it's almost one of those things that you have to say offhandedly because it, you're uh, – you know, I think we're both kind of self-deprecating and, um, you know, oh, I would never say that about myself um, because that sounds too important. But it's the right. absolute truth and you almost have to say it offhandedly because you right. would never allow yourself to say something like that. Right. Yeah. That's why you have good friends who say it for you. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. That's, uh, that, it's true because it um, that's what you need good friends for, to remind you, hey, listen, buddy, you know – this is what you're, what you told me, this is what you're, what you're supposed to do, do it, you know, in, 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 in any words you want to pick, but that's, that's the value of the, of a really good friendship to say, to remind us of what we, what we really want to do. Yeah. Well, which, I appreciate that very much. Which is weird because writing is such a solitary thing. Um, and, and that's why we, we need to keep those relationships because, um, you know, when you spend, uh, you know, all of your time in your in your writing cave, and and I think you actually have a downstairs um, room that you converted into almost a literal writing cave. Um, 
you can you can forget those things and you need to be reminded. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, yeah. So uh, another thing I wanted to ask you was with with finishing this uh, trilogy, and I, I know that you're also writing um, kind of a, a mystery crime thriller uh, under a pen name, which I. I think is awesomely exciting. Um, <laughs> so, so now you have this, this kind of uh, post-apocalyptic fantasy trilogy done. Um, the three feathers is a uh, fable and a, uh, a very deceptive book because it looks like a children's book on the outside. And on the inside, it is a gut punch to the heart um, that, you know, is, is awesome for all ages. Um, and and then you've got uh, you know the the fourth sage, which is this uh, almost uh, you know, futuristic techno thriller, post apocalyptic kind of thing, and, and so you're and and then you know of course the um, the traveler, uh, the, this great time travel story with that is just heartbreaking. Um, you you are a man of eclectic taste, and um, and I love that you have kind of defied uh, genre expectations. And uh, I was talking with someone the other day, and I'm sitting here trying to remember who it was. I think it was Dan Kinney. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. Dan uh, has this amazing series of children's books. Um, and he's also now writing a series of mystery books. And, uh, and we were talking about, you know, that, that people come to expect certain things from you. And, and a lot of people get put in a box and they're afraid to write anything outside of that. And uh, we were talking about authors like Neil Gaiman who kind of right. defy expectation and their, right. their genre is awesome. They just like, like literally they write awesome books and they may, <laughs> they may be, they may be a fantasy. They may be, you know, mm-hmm. this other thing. You don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be awesome. And I, I kind of put you in that, uh, in that box as well. Like, oh, I, I don't know what's going to come out of Stefan, but I know it's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> it, is there ever any temptation to, uh, you know, to follow up the three feathers with another fable? Uh, or, uh, you know, is, was that book so personal that it can't be followed up or it can't be replicated with maybe a different scenario or, or whatever it's, you know, um, is it real that, that you have to follow your heart to, to write what comes next? And it may or may, may not be, uh, what people expect. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think, um, it really depends on also where you are in your own journey at this moment. When I wrote the three, three feathers, there was I was in a specific uh, state in my mind, in a way, and the, the three feathers came out of that. And I have, uh, and the fourth sage was the follow up. But I have a, pr- I have about twenty thousand words in the the precursor to the three feathers, which is called the second searcher, which is set a thousand years earlier, but then um, other things happened and I kind of moved, moved on from that part of my life in a way. And I'm not sure if I'm going to go back there. I, I might, it depends on, you know, if I'm, if I catch that kind of, that kind of mindset that I was back then in a different way, but it would, it, I think it's always circular. You know, our journeys are always a little circular. We, we learn something, we drop it, we learn something else, drop it. And then we go five, six different things. And then we pick the first one up again, go deeper, drop it again to the second one, go deeper. So it could, it's possible that I would go back there because I think there's still a lot that hasn't been explored in that story. Um, but I'm not sure. It's it's always for me. I think it's a char- if a character, if I can identify with the character, and if there's an emotional hook to it that pulls me in, I think that's the most important thing. And then the genre is it doesn't. I don't think it matters at all. I mean that uh, a genre is just like a color. You know, you have a car and it's blue or red or white or yellow, doesn't matter, but the car is the most important. Yeah. 
you know, the engine and how it drives and all that stuff. I, I like but, to think of, of genre as, uh, as window dressing, like that, that we we're, you're, you're decorating a room, uh, with the story and the, the, the genre is just the window dressing, the stuff that people see that let them know, exactly, okay, exactly. this, this is what this kind of story is, but it's still a story about the human experience and how we interact right. with each other. And this right. is just the, the stuff that helps us kind of put it into storytelling context, maybe. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, so tell me about this this mystery that you're writing because we have not talked about this at all. I, I've seen you post right. about it, and um, I, I've seen what you've said uh, publicly about it. But this this is very. Uh, I think this is going to be a really visceral story. And uh, how did how did this come about? Um, I, I yeah, I, I'm not 100 percent sure how it came about, but. <laughs> Are we ever? <laughs> it's, are we ever? You know, but it's 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 basically taken meets deliverance. That would be my uh, that would be my uh, my short pitch to you in an elevator. Okay. You know, you're the executive. I'm I'm the the little writer guy, and I would pitch that to you in those two words. But um, basically, it's a. Do you own a banjo? The, um, ladle, <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I can yodel, but that has really nothing to do with anything. But um, no, so so anyway, so I don't know wh- where it exactly came from, but it's basically the story about um, a nanny and a twelve-year-old boy, and the twelve-year-old boy is the son of the CEO in Cincinnati. They have the C- you know, he has a a lot of money. And they live in this mansion, and the nanny is this, the daughter of a car mechanic. Um, she has been working on cars since she was 10 or 11, and she knows, she knows everything. She knows a lot about cars, and she's very handy with cars and everything. And, but she's also studying astrology. Um, she loves the stars and uh, astronomy. Sorry, not astro- astronomy. <laughs> as- astronomy. Um, she's going to the college in Cincinnati for that. But she's also a nanny with this boy, and the mother died a year ago, so there's this family history there. And she is with the boy, and the uh, the housekeeper is a, a Japanese woman, and she runs a very tight ship. And there is this schedule that they have in the summer, right? It's like the the boy goes to the swimming classes, and it's a very precise schedule. Like a nanny with with a child has a relatively precise schedule. Right. So they are they have this routine that they do every day. They go to the he, she picks him up from the swimming school. They go for a picnic in the park. They go home. There's some lesson here and there and then stuff in the evening. So she the boy uh, one day she's with the boy having a picnic in that park and the boy gets kidnapped. But because she's there, obviously, they take her. So they take her and the boy. And um, the the housekeeper, I'm not telling you the whole story. I'm just telling you the setup. You know what I mean? Right, right. So don't worry. Um, so the housekeeper, they're 20 minutes late. And she calls the police. And she goes to the precinct, actually. And she says to the to the guy at the front desk, Something happened to the boy and the nanny. They are 35 minutes now late. And the guy says, you know, 24 hours, blah, blah, blah. You know, we need, there's no way we can get a thing out after half an hour. And she says, you don't understand. This is like a clockwork. If her phone breaks down, she uses his phone. If his phone breaks down, she goes to a gas station. If anything comes up, she calls me. There's never any interruption in communication ever. So this this detective over here, this young, very young detective, overhears them in walking by with her very passionate speech about the 30 minutes are over. Something has happened. So that's how he gets involved in this cat and mouse game that now starts because she and the boy are being taken three hours south of Cincinnati, which is the, the poorest part of, mo- one of the poorest parts of the country in Kentucky, uh, into this compound that is a gang of like 20, 25 family members 
other people. They have guns, drugs, uh, dogs. I mean, it's, it's like this absolutely terrifying, isolated compound, miles and miles from anything. And she's there with the boy. So that's basically the setup for the story. You know, is she going to be able to, she has to protect the boy from the people. She has to protect herself from, you know, whatever happens to her. Meanwhile, the detective has to search for her with no clues whatsoever. There's no zero, you know, they don't know where they are. So that's the, that's the story. Oh, man. Obviously, she's a car mechanic. You know what you can do with that. You know, there's some really cool stuff that can happen. And um, she's also an astronomy uh, student, so she knows the stars. She knows where north, you know. So, right. so there are some ways to help them. And the other thing is, the boy is fluent in Japanese because his mother was Japanese, oh. and he has t- taught her Japanese. Oh, I love so it. So they can now talk in Japanese that the the kidnappers don't understand a word. Oh, that's amazing. So anyway, so so you know, there's a whole setup for a really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and and while that sounds like nothing you have done before, it still sounds like a Stefan Volt story. <laughs> like, I, like I, I totally, get, I know exactly. I, I don't know what you're gonna do, but I know what you're gonna do. I, I know that that this character, you're gonna, you you have this way of drawing characters that um, that seem uh, like they are, uh, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but but seem like they're nothing on the outside. But on the inside, they have tools and they have gifts and and stuff that that they just need to realize they have. And I, I think that's one of the great things about your writing is that uh, is that you really believe that people are special and that uh, and that great things can happen. Right. Right. Uh, Stefan, this has been so much fun to catch up. Uh, the new book, The White Dragon. Uh, it, the the third one is called Alchemy. It is out now everywhere. Um, what would you say to people that maybe um, well, for the first thing we're going to say is everybody go buy the book, uh, buy all three. And I think this fall we're going to have a, an omnibus uh, edition uh, with them right. all collected into one. That'll be awesome. Um, so you can you can buy all three and then you can collect the omnibus uh, in paperback as well because everybody needs to collect that. Um, but what if people out there are, you know, maybe they're in that struggling uh, spot where, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just I don't know what to do. Am I doing this right? Am, am I am I reaching anybody? Does does the thing I'm doing even matter? Um, what would you say to those people? Well, <laughs> I mean, this is that's a constant reminder. Um, but the one thing I think is very important is that. We we tend to go by the fo- how many f- followers we have, like on Instagram, for example. Oh, you know, I only have 400 followers or or only 500 people have read my book or anything like that. First of all, Jesus had 12. Followers, <laughs> and one of, right? and one of them mean, stabbed him in the back. So exactly. So the, it, it's not the quantity that matters. I had one experience with a with a young uh, girl that, that I read to the three feathers. She was in fourth grade. Um, we did the reading. She bought the book. She didn't have money to buy it. And somebody that was at the reading, a dad of one of the other students, because her family is very poor. She bought the book for her. She, he gave it to her. She read it overnight. She wrote me back this long uh, note that she said she she knows she wants to start writing now. She is so, uh, she knows what she wants to do and it totally inspired her. I can't remember exactly what she said, but so if you, if you change one person's outlook slightly, that should be enough. Shouldn't it be enough? I mean, what's the, what is the, I mean, I'm asking myself that question. What is the number that satisfies us? Us? If it's a thousand, we need fifteen hundred. If it's fifteen hundred, we need ten thousand. If it's ten thousand, we need a million. We will not be satisfied with any number because then wh- why aren't I in in uh, in in Sweden? You know why why am I not translating into Swedish or Finnish? Right? There's always something that's missing. 
So we should always go back to one person. Did it affect one person? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. There's the answer. So, you know, the, because the, the one number one is the number. If you have if you have changed one person's outlook, that's it. Because that one person might be might have a son or a daughter who becomes president or what? I mean, whatever whatever happens. But I think that the going back to that number. 12, you know, <laughs> 12 is a good number. And, but I, I think one person is where, what you're writing for to I, change one person's mind. And, and I think that is fantastic because if you set an arbitrary sales goal number, um, that number will never be enough because you can always, you can always add one more to it. Well, okay. I sold 5,000 exactly. books this month, but I could have sold 5,001. And, and you, exactly. it, it never satisfies, but knowing that you hit someone on a heart level, um, that satisfies in a way that uh, a royalty check could never do. Right. The greatest, exactly. the greatest compliment I ever got uh, was from a reader that emailed me and said that she finished uh, reading writer's block and she hated me because I made her snot cry. And, uh, and to me, I was right. like, my work here's done. I, I, I made, exactly. I made a stranger snot cry and my work is done. <laughs> I, that's, that's all I ever needed to hear. <laughs> it, it's true. Yeah. It's, it really, yeah. that's all really you can do. It's really true. You know, uh, person. Stefan, thank you for coming on the show again. And, uh, thank you for being my friend. Uh, the, uh, you know, the white dragon alchemy is out everywhere now and we need people to go buy it. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on the show, buddy. Thanks, Hank. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the star maidens. He watched her words as she spoke her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. Long ago, a Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic and in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden. She was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife, so he seized her and threw her over his shoulder, and she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much. But she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock. And she begged her sisters, Please appear, please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to Earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby. But they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. 
Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the Star Maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return. <laughs>